Hello, today we'll talk about uh, image denoising um, and uh, what we did last, uh, last lecture was talking more about identifying the noise models, the most common noise models. We have some examples. And then we focus on denoising algorithms that utilize spatial attributes, spatial filters. And uh, the most common ones were uh, are the, the, the averaging filters uh, in, in some capacity, and then we have the ranking filters. And then we ended uh, the discussion on a note about um, how can you uh, combine the benefit between these two classes of, uh, of filtering algorithms, and we had an example like the trimmed mean filter. And then the next uh, subject will be um, how can we do this in the, in the, in the frequency domain? As you have seen in previous previous materials and previous classes that um, uh, in, in many cases, the if you take the Fourier transform of a signal, then the noise is uh, mostly present in the high frequency components. If you filter that out, as we have seen last uh, in the introduction of last lecture, then what you will end up with is uh, the low frequency comp comp uh, components uh, that are denoised um, in, the, in the signal, which means that we have some blaring blaring effect or artifact and side effect of getting to the high frequency component. Today we'll talk about, um, we'll talk about uh, Wien filtering uh, and uh, the main principle, I will not spend time de de deriving it. Uh, some other courses uh, you can, uh, you will be able uh, to spend quite a bit of time to derive this principle. Uh, it's called the orthogonality principle. And in this case, uh, what uh, this principle is telling us is that if we are trying to find an optimal estimator and optimal in the sense of mean square error, uh, then the error vector is orthogonal to the data or the observation that you have G, which has the noise uh, in the signal. So uh, to set up the problem, we have a signal G of N, this is our observation. It has the noise. And uh, the original signal before having the noise is called F of N. Um, and you would like to estimate F uh, by some kind of linear combination of G of N. So the orthogonality principle is telling us that the error, which is the difference between the original signal F and the estimate of F. So the estimate of F we mentioned is a combination or a, or a weighted combination of the observation signal G. So this whole thing is the error. And the difference between the error and, um, and, and, and the signal G these are two are orthogonal to each other, and we have it in this form in here. So if we um, rearrange uh, these frames together, what you will have on the left-hand side in here is nothing but the cross-correlation between F and G. And then what you have on the right-hand side in here is nothing but the weighted uh, autocorrelation components or, or the product between the autocorrelation of G times this vector in here and this that will give us an estimate of G. So, you know, we're going to be not for now so that we have a way to find the cross correlation between F and G. So the, the quantity on the left-hand side is known. This quantity in here, the correlation of G is known. And what we are really after in this whole setup is to find these weights. So we can solve for that. So to put this into more of a, a formal uh, problem statement, we have two correlated um, zero mean signals, that's the assumption. And these signals are F of M and N, this is the original image, and we have the G of M and N. Um, and F is the original image, G is our observation image. Given the observation of G of M and N, we have, we, what our goal is to estimate F of M and N such that the mean squared error between our estimate of F, which we'll call it as F hat, and F is minimized. So difference between F and F hat um, square, that's our error square, and we have expected value of that error square. We'd like to really minimize that, and we'll, that will give us our F hat in this. So, in overall, this is really a challenging problem. However, um, we, in the Wiener filter case, we are looking at a specific uh, type of um, estimation, which is uh, we have a weight. So we have a linear combination of weights. So, we're really make, translating this uh, problem into becoming a linear uh, problem. So what this equation here, we have our observation G of K and L, and uh, K and L can 
uh, are, the, are the terms, uh, the limits on the sum to two summations. And what we have on the left hand side is our estimation of F, which is F hat of M and N. These weights in here, and we, they have to de depend on, on, the, on, on where we are in the signal itself, right? And what are we estimating, which is M and N. So that's why we have these indices in here, M and N, K and L, to indicate that. Because you can imagine that we are already uh, operating at a certain location in G of uh, G, so those basically will determine uh, the K, be determined from the K and L. And then what we are estimating is really in the F hat, which is really a function of M and N. So we need to include these both, these sets of indices in there. And now um, what we want to do is really to, our criteria is, again, this is the mean square error. Uh, so we'd like to expect the value of the error square, which is F minus F hat square for all M and N. We have two assumptions and we'll add a third assumption throughout the lecture today. Uh, these assumptions are as follows. The first two assumptions that our original image F and our observation image G are jointly YSN stationary. And if you remember, that means what? It means the means are constant. It's a, only a, the correlation depends only on the difference between the indices of the inputs. So not really absolute values, but the differences. So we can really write the, the correlation, the cross correlation uh, and the auto correlation uh, uh, for these signals as really a function of the difference in the indices uh, and, and that will do. And then the other assumption that we have held a uh, long time ago, that our signal F of M and N and our noise are uncorrelated. So the noise will not depend on our signal in this case. So <coughs> there's a derivation here for um, the derivative um, and with respect to the weights um, and equate that to zero. Uh, I used to cover that, but that would take a, maybe a half a lecture or so. But um, you, we don't have to worry about the derivation for this. The principle will we'll assume that it's, it's given, um, or we'll, we'll take it as it is. So what we have is, this uh, This is the error, right? The difference between our original image F and uh, our estimate of F, which is a linear combination and the linear, linear weights are the Ws of our observation G of P. And uh, this error is orthogonal on the signal G of L. So we just um, uh, go with the, with this principle. What we will end up with, we will have uh, on the left-hand side in here, we have nothing but the cross correlation between F and G. And then uh, in here on the right-hand side, we have the summation of these weights, and then we have the autocorrelation of G, right? But keep in mind, uh, we have the white sense stationary assumption. So the left-hand side in here is really nothing but the cross-correlation as a function of M minus R and M minus S. And then the odd correlation here of G is really R sub GG of K minus R and N minus S. So if we do that, then uh, we, we, we um, and then by the equation in the previous slide to have this for in here. And then given what um, what we have in here, we have M and R, uh, M minus R, M minus S, we have a uh, disease of K and M for the summation, and then we have K minus R and M minus S. So what we would like to do next is really to introduce some change of variable, and you will see in a minute how that will simplify how the, how the equation looks. So we'll have M prime equal to M minus R, and N prime as N minus S, K prime as K minus R, and L prime as L minus S. And then we'll have R and FG of M prime, N prime uh, here. So it just basically substitution uh, with this M, M, M prime and N prime. Now what you observe in this equation here, that on the left-hand side, what you have as the indices or the variables as M prime and N prime. On the right-hand side, you have the summation, uh, the summation terms um, are, are a function of K prime and L prime. We have the autocorrelation function of K prime and L prime. But if you observe, so M prime we need it from the left hand side, the M prime we need it, the K prime we need it for the indices of the summation, and the L prime. But R and S in here, they are, um, in a way, they are there, but uh, that means uh, this equation can hold for any value for R and S, right? Any value for R and S, this equation will hold uh, in here. So it's the same for all values for R and S. So we can choose the values for R and S um, to make this, uh, these things. Uh, simplified, right? And 
So one way to do that, to say, I, I really don't want these weights to be a function of the left hand, the right hand side, right? I wanna have some kind of a stationary um, uh, uh, distribution. So I would like to, for example, to make these indices zeros, right? So I would like, if I choose R to be negative K prime and S to be negative L prime, then I can achieve that. And that's what we do. Um, so that means this whole equation can be simplified to the following, uh, which is the cross correlation on the left hand side equal to the sum uh, of uh, these weights, which are a function of the difference between M and K and L minus L and those correlations. So what you see in here in this equation, what we have is nothing but what? A convolution between the odd correlation and these weights. So uh, the cross correlation between F and G on the left hand side is nothing but an, a convolution between our our filter weights, the Ws, and our autocorrelation of the observation signal G. If you take the Fourier transform of this, we know basically from previous study that uh, what you will get on the left-hand side is weights in the frequency domain. And then we have a ratio between two power spectral densities. One is S sub Fg and the other one is S sub G, G in this case. And then um, we have some, in the next few slides, we have some simplification for this expression. But this expression here is the general uh, Wiener filter derivation. So this is the ratio between these two power spectral densities will give you the Wiener filter that you can use uh, to, to, to operate on your, on your noisy signal and denoise it. So uh, what, what, what we'll do next is we have some um, uh, assumption on the relationship between F and G. And we will use that to do some simplification for the Wiener filter. So the first one is, which you can see from the previous uh, lecture, that was mainly the, the noise that we have been dealing with. Um, um, let's assume that we have an additive noise. What does that mean? That means that our observation signal G or image is equal to the F, the original image, F plus the noise B. So that's really our uh, our specific condition. But keep in mind, this is a special case of this. So what we will be um, doing next uh, is uh, to say, this is the general we are filtered. Now let's see what happens to this expression. How can we simplify it if we have additive noise? Um, so, uh, so if from this relationship between the G, the F and the noise, because we have additive noise, uh, then we can uh, uh, calculate the expected value of basically uh, G times G with a shift. We can get the autocorrelation of G on the left hand side. And then keep in mind that the noise and the image are still the assumption holds. These two assumptions that we had at the very beginning that both of them are really wise and stationary. They only depends on the difference in indices. And the second assumption, the noise is not correlated with the, with the signal F. So that still holds. Um, but now that we are adding another uh, assumption, which is that G is equal to F plus F. So this is really our, our assumption here, this additive noise. So we can calculate um, with that, we can really have uh, an expression that relates the power spectral density of G to F and the noise. And you can see it just basically is an additive one. So now what we want from these two expressions, we have to calculate S sub FG and S sub GG. So for S sub GG, we already have it um, from this equation here. And now what we want to do is to calculate S sub FG. All right. So let's see we calculate the cross correlation between F and G for this special case, right? So the expression is the expected value of the first, we have F of R plus M, S plus N, and then G uh, conjugate of R and S, right? And we have the conjugate just for completeness, although we are already dealing with uh, real images in here. Um, so, um, so remember, the difference, we are really still, the difference between them in the indices, R plus M minus R will give us M, and then S plus N minus S will give us N. So we're still satisfying the first condition assumption. We started with this whole derivation. So now, uh, so until now, this is really a general case, but we know that G is equal to the F plus the noise, right? And uh, we can uh, simplify this further. So we have the expected value of F times F conjugate. 
plus the expected value of f and the noise, right? But we know that the second assumption we made uh, originally, that the signal f and the image f and the noise are uncorrelated. So this expression here becomes a zero, right? This becomes a zero. Uh, and now what we are left with, on the left-hand side, we have the cross correlation between f and g. And then here we have a expected value of f times f conjugate. So now you can see uh, from here, what uh, the cross correlation between f and g is nothing but the auto correlation of f for this specific case of the additive noise. So now we can have s sub fg is equal to the power spectral density of our signal f. So let's we go back to our expression. This is the general expression for the wind filter, the ratio between these two power spectral densities. And we, from the calculations so far, we have s sub fg as the power spectral density of f, and then s sub gg because of the additive noise is the sum of the power spectral density of f and the power spectral density of our noise s sub dv, right? And basically now this, this expression uh, in here is the expression for the Wiener filter when we have additive noise, right? When we have specifically additive noise that's basically being added uh, to the image. Um, so that's something I always notice that students make that mistake uh, uh, by, by, by either forgetting that this expression only for that case, or uh, they forget that this expression, what they should use when we have additive noise. And, and uh, uh, if you have this in an exam, for example, uh, then it becomes really, uh, takes some time to, to deal with this expression, while you have this expression will be much easier uh, if you have additive noise. Uh, so this is something I think you should take note of. Um, uh, 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 in your notes. Um, let's look at what we have done so far. So now, uh, once you have the filter, right, you have the W, then now you, uh, you, you're, you're, you, you have the G, right? And then you have the product between the Fourier transform of G with your uh, Wiener filter, and then that will give you an estimate of your uh, F um, in the frequency domain you do the inverse Fourier transform to get your small f hat. Right? But it's really interesting to look at this in the frequency domain because there are some uh, some some cases uh, in here, some special cases. So if we divide, so this is the expression that you have after you calculate the power spectral density for f. Of course, the question that you have to ask yourself is, we don't even know what f is. How can we really uh, estimate f? Um, so we'll we'll look at that in, in a few minutes and. What are the practical ways to do that? And then here um, you have the power spectral density of F and you have the power spectral density of the noise. And again, as, as I mentioned last time, uh, this estimation of what kind of noise happening, look at the flat area in the image, give you some kind of uh, information how you can estimate uh, this, this uh, power spectral density of the noise S sub B. Anyway, so if we divide by S sub FF, uh, both the numerator and the denominator, we will have this expression here. Right? So we'll have one over one plus um, the power spectral density or the ratio between the power spectral densities of the noise and the F, the signal, respectively. So look at these two cases. Um, the first one, if the power spectral density of the noise is much more overwhelming uh, compared to the power spectral density of the signal F. So if that's the case, then this expression here is very large, right? Um, correct. Uh, then in, in this case, this whole one over a very large area is, is basically is a, is a zero, right? So this whole expression gives you no estimation of f hat. Why? Because what you are really dealing with um, is really purely, what g is, is purely noise, right? It's, it's uh, not purely, but primarily noise, right? It's overwhelming the uh, presence of the noise the signal, the intensity varies of the original image is almost gone, right? So, so you don't really have much um, information to have a good estimation of, of, uh, of the original signal. On the other hand, um, if the power spectral density of the signal F is really the major component in here compared to the, compared to the noise, or in other words, the signal to noise ratio is really high, then what you will have in here, this expression here, uh, becomes really very close to zero, right? Very, very small. And then um, uh, that means what? Uh, that means 
this whole ratio in here is almost one. That means your best estimate is the same that you have, which is G, right? Um, and then everything else in, in between these two extreme cases uh, in, in, this, in this particular uh, situation. Um, remember when we had in the problem statement, we mentioned that um, F and G, uh, we assume or we suppose they have zero, uh, zero mean. So the, this is just a slide to tell you that if that's not the case, uh, then you subtract uh, the means first, you do the same operation via a filter, and then you bring the mean of the uh, signal back uh, after, after filtering. And that will give you an estimate of F hat in here. Uh, so now um, when we look at um, the Weissen stationary for the entire image, uh, but what happens if you'd like to uh, use that assumption and to do that, we need to relax it a little bit when we just look and operate at a small window, right? A small window uh, or a small sub image in the whole image. Um, so uh, what what can we do in that case? Um, so in, in, in this kind of the practical implementation of what we are having. So here is kind of uh, what what's really involved in the in the, in operating into this adaptive local Wiener filter on small windows in the image. So um, let's assume that our noise has zero mean white noise and it has a variance sigma square v, and uh, and we can have um, a model for the image into these small uh, local windows, right? So uh, this assumption is that uh, now, yes, we have the entire image f, but let's just now operate on a sub image or a sub or a block in the image, a small block in the image, and just call that our signal f for now, for that block. Um, and then uh, we can uh, have, uh, because remember in an actual image, if you have a window that's really small in the image, then there is not really much of variation um, and not really, uh, structure is not very well defined in that. So we, we have kind of this model, uh, does it really always work? Uh, no, uh, but uh, for, Certain parts of images for uh, natural images, it works if the window is really small enough. There's not really structure very well defined in small windows. So we can hold this model, uh, which is um, we have the local mean, mu f, and then um, we have the sigma f, the, the, the standard deviation, that's the local in that window. And then we scale that, uh, or we use it as a scale for a, a zero mean white uh, noise uh, with a unit variance. Right now. So a normal, uh, normal distribution here. And um, that's basically what this is mean is that we are really assuming that we have this kind of uh, Gaussian uh, distribution of the data and then it's scaled by uh, the local uh, sigma standard distribution and by the, uh, the average in that block. Um, um, so this is kind of a, a practical, uh, a practical uh, way to do that. And, if we use that, uh, then now we can go back to our, again, the assumptions hold that white sense stationary, the noise and the image are uncorrelated. And then finally, um, that we have additive noise. So these are three assumptions that are still holding on uh, to in this, in this uh, adaptive case. So now uh, the, the, the power square density for F is sigma square F. Uh, and then the summation here is sigma square F and sigma square V in this case. So this is basically kind of a, a ratio between these two uh, numbers. Uh, then uh, we have a filter is nothing but basically a delta scaled by this, these numbers in here. And um, if you bring everything back, what's the F hat? Remember, we add at the very end, we add uh, the, the mean of F that we started with. And remember when we started with G, we subtract from it the mean of the signal and the mean of the noise. And then we convolve it with our filter uh, so this is in a spatial domain, and this becomes basically our spatial wiener filter. And then uh, we can simplify this to be of this form, right? Um, now, as as you shift the window, right, um, to the next pixel, um, then what you need to update is these values, the, the, the mean f and the sigma f. There will be small changes, but you need to update these into, uh, into, um, into this equation. This one here, this one there and these ones uh, in here. 
And uh, once you do that, then you, you have really another estimate of uh, F hat to that particular pixel. And you keep doing that um, uh, as, as you shift. Um, okay, um, so this is the same uh, same as uh, just a illustration. Uh, uh, what else? Yes, here, this one. Uh, so what happens in this case? Um, so we have, uh, this is just in here, F hat is equal to this ratio times G plus this ratio times the mean value G. And now what we have, we have this kind of dynamic between uh, the sigma square F as original image and the sigma square V of the, from the noise. Again, we, we, we can make some estimate, estimation of these. So what happens if we have a very high signal to noise ratio, as this is really the case in here. Uh, so if that's the case, then what that means, um, that, that means the, 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 uh, the noise presence is really very little. So what we have in G is really good enough, right? Um, and that is actually reflected in here. If you, um, if you divide by sigma square F, uh, numerator and denominator in this exhibition here, then sigma square V divided by sigma square F will be, uh, will be close to zero. So what we'll have in here is one times G. And then this one here will be, uh, will be equal to uh, uh, zero, right? Right, uh, make sure. Divide by this, yes. So the sigma square F will be very large. So this whole thing will be very close to zero. The second term will be equal to a zero. In, in our modeling, what that means, because remember the model we had was the mean plus the sigma times come some kind of a white, uh, zero mean white noise. Uh, what this means uh, that we have a very high detail in the region, a lot of uh, dynamic in that, in that block, a small region in the image. And that basically means that the, uh, the, the noise is really not, uh, not present, um, uh, not effective enough. So we can have G as our best estimate. This is the other hand, uh, the other extreme case. And in this case, uh, that the noise is really overwhelming. Uh, so in this expression, this in here, uh, this will be equal to a zero. This expression here, because sigma square F is much smaller. So this will be very close to a one. And then that means our F hat, the best estimate is the mean value of uh, of G within that block. And basically that's the best, our best estimate. It, it's, again, as we had in the previous case, it's, it's really just G is given, gives us the best, the best estimate that we have. Um, so this is just uh, putting everything together um, into, into one, 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 uh, one page, uh, which we talked about uh, uh, before. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll talk about some results, but uh, we made some assumptions um, uh, in the derivation for the Weissen stationary for the uncorrelation between F and the noise. Uh, in general, in most applications that have natural images, not computational images, but natural images in general, those assumptions are, uh, are, are valid uh, to some extent. But uh, with the assumption that we made about having this kind of uh, stationarity between the, low, the, the windowing uh, in here. But if you look carefully, if you look at this block and this block in here and this block, these are very different from each other. So um, it, the statistics uh, really change as you, as you move from one block to the, to the other. So the stationarity can be really uh, stretched quite a bit uh, as, as, as we have seen. So, I just want to have some kind of uh, comparisons, um, and this is hopefully bring back what I talked about last time. Is uh, you look at the image, how you perceive the quality, and then you look at the noise. Okay. So again, as I mentioned, uh, I think I had an office hours on the lecture last time. Uh, this is this is severe, um, mild to severe. I would say not mild. I mean, this is severe, medium to severe. Uh, distortion because sigma is really 20, that's really high. Uh, so um, we have uh, the zoomed in um, the inner image, and this is the sigma, is a white, is a Gaussian noise, Gaussian blare with sigma 20. And these are uh, six different ways to denoise, right? We have the Gaussian smoothing, gives us the always, or most of the time, uh, blurring. Uh, the anisotropic filtering, and this we had, we, we saw this last time. The bilateral filtering, uh, so this 
And then now uh, what I have, I'm adding here that I haven't really talked about is um, hard thresholding wavelet transform and soft thresholding wavelet transform. Basically you go to the trans wavelet transform, look at the high frequency coefficient, you get rid of them uh, using a soft threshold or higher threshold, um, and then uh, you inverse, um, and this is the, the image you get. But we, don't, we didn't talk about those uh, in, in detail. And then what we have in here is the adaptive uh, local modeling based uh, uh, winded wheel filter. Um, so uh, if you compare all of these uh, performance wise, um, I, I, you can see basically it's, uh, um, this is blurry compared to the others. This one here is kind of more of, uh, there's this kind of thickness to the, to the, to the structure of the image. Uh, it's almost like uh, using um, some kind of a super pixel kind of algorithm to make it more like artistic uh, version of the image. Uh, you can see some artifacts in here uh, for sure, but not, they're not blurry. Um, you can see some artifacts in here. You see quite a bit of artifacts uh, in, the, in these cases in here. Um, but overall, if you compare all of these together, you see the wind and wheel filter is an okay, right? I mean, it's, a, it's a, between the wind filter and the bilateral filtering, these two are, are really kind of reasonable um, trade off between uh, the very blurry and the artifact uh, filled uh, wave transport. Um, um, so, in, in this case, um, you say, okay, this, this, this actually is, is helpful. Um, but uh, as we always emphasize this, uh, we should not only look at the denoised image, we should look at what kind of noise estimate uh, has been, has taken place. So if you take each one of these images and subtract it from the G, which is this image on the left hand side, that will give us um, the, our, our estimate, estimate of the noise. And you can see in here in the Gaussian smoothing, this is the estimate, uh, and these are the six estimates in here. And you can see, uh, really the worst ones are with the Gaussian smoothing, the soft wave transform. If you use this as, as a criteria alone, uh, then you can see basically this is really bad, right? Uh, it's in, in the, in the is if this is our estimate of the noise, and we, we know that the noise is uncorrelated with the image F, but the, the, our estimate of the noise has quite a bit of the feature of the image. Same thing in here, same thing in here. And then to some extent we have some of those features here. And then we have them a little bit here. This is the best actually in, in among all of these. We, 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 this is the least kind of, we don't really have much in here. But in here you can see we have uh, the shoulder, we have kind of the, 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 uh, the face, uh, the jaw in here. Um, so we have, we have these lines in here, um, we have these lines in here, we have those lines in here, but if you look at this area, there's an improvement. Uh, so this one is really kind of winning in this, this criteria. Although in here, um, I would say, at least for me, perception wise, this one is the winning one. Uh, so always you have to really look at both, both of these uh, in here. Um, so we can um, kind of uh, agree on this assessment, uh, and there's a general agreement in the community about this, um, more or less. Uh, when you look at the spatial methods, that's the ones we talked about, either mean filters or rank filters, or um, you know, like the ones we talked about last time. Um, we are very happy with how um, the, the the denoised image looked in general, and especially if you take take the trimmed mean filter, for example, you get rid of the blurriness. Um, but uh, the noise estimation, as illustrated in the previous slide, is always horrible, right? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's really bad. Um, and then in the transform methods that we, we transform to either the wavelet frequency domain or Wiener filtering, um, these are all transform methods. Um, they, we, we, the, the, the resulting image usually, is, it has this kind of artifact. Um, uh, so we are not really uh, very thrilled about that. The quality, but our estimate of the noise is, is usually is good. Uh, so we have the, the algorithms really did a very good job in estimating the, the, the noise, but bringing back that, the denoising to bring the structure of the image, um, it, it's, it's really the shortcoming in here. So you can see there is this trade-off uh, between, between these methods. Any questions? 
Yeah. Any comments on this result? Now, as I promised last time, I want to spend some time to talk about um, kind of state of the art non uh, neural network based uh, methods. And these kind of are agreed upon in the last 10 years or so, are really the ones that stand out quite a bit. Um, and uh, what we studied so far are kind of the fundamental methods. Uh, we had the spatial methods, and then we had uh, the transfer method, mainly the Wiener filter, but you can think of, uh, you know, taking the image into any frequency domain, either wavelets or DFT or DCT, and getting rid of the high frequency uh, component using some method, either thresholding, like a hard threshold or, or a soft threshold, um, and then bring the image back after, after doing that. That's kind of transfer methods. Um, and, and in general, uh, these are kind of the methods uh, that stand out. Uh, so non-local mean uh, is one uh, that's really uh, very, very simple, but it's effective. And then we have these transfer methods, um, but I really wouldn't want to spend time over talking about them because I want to talk about PM3D uh, mainly. And uh, I will not talk in detail about it um, in, in, into the specifics, but the idea that PM3D and NLM are bringing is extremely important. Uh, especially for people who are doing this project. Uh, it doesn't matter actually if it's denoising, denoisy project or something else. How you can really build your your, 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 your dictionary uh, or your feature space so you can really learn from it um, and use it. Um, so I'll spend more time the next 20 minutes or so on, on these methods. Uh, just for the sake of kind of FYI, um, the, 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 the transform method uh, uh, DLS GSM is really you go to the wavelet domain, you assume you have a Gaussian mixture, and then you use the base least square uh, to do the estimation. Um, and then you know it's using that. So that's all what I want to talk about uh, for, for this method. Um, so really, um, let's now talk about in all what we have discussed so far. Um, when, when we do um, local filtering, um, we, we kind of look at this window, right? Uh, we say there is this window in here, um, and this window can be very small, as small as 16 by 16 or 32 by 32. It can be larger than that, like 51 times 51. But there's this assumption that um, uh, the pixels um, within that window, they, they share um, the, or they come from the same PDF, or they come from the same statistical ensemble, right? Uh, but it's not the case, right? Uh, not always the case. Uh, so now the question is uh, that to me, people ask themselves around 15 years ago, actually, or so, uh, is the following. How can we make sure that uh, we only group pixels with each other uh, if we have some kind of a criteria that gives us uh, some confidence in at least really coming from the same uh, statistical, uh, uh, or they have the same statistics. Um, so this way is really kind of, uh, you can think of this as a smarter localization. Uh, that you don't really just mix things that don't really belong to each other, even though they are next to each other neighborhood-wise. Um, so it's kind of reducing the, the false mixing. Um, so, um, you can think of this as, um, can I look at my image as, as, a, uh, as, as, a, as a number of multiple images, right? Uh, if I take, and this is where HDR, you can think of a high dynamic range um, where you have basically different exposure and then using them all together as if they are really coming from different frames temporarily. And then you have a better estimate of the quality of that image. That's the HDR that we have in our phones now. Um, so uh, over time, basically what's happening, the signal itself, like when you have different exposure, right? The data itself, the signal, the, the, the intensity values, the structure, uh, the, the, the geometry, the photometric uh, content of the image, they, they are fixed, they're stat static, they, they are not changing. What's really changed is the noise, right? The noise is the one that changes over time, right? 
And that's basically the whole idea is that our signal if from an end over time, it remains constant. Our noise in here, uh, it, it varies over time and it remains with a, a, an assumption of zero mean. Um, but the idea it really varies. So the signal is, is fixed. So, um, and that's basically the idea in here. You can see, we keep adding noise and noise, different noises, and you see the structure of the image uh, originally stay the same. So the idea now, uh, can, I, can I use these different instances of the same image, which is the same structure, same geometric distribution, same geometric distribution, and, but the noise is the difference. So I keep adding, I keep adding, and I can see in here as I keep adding more, I'm denoising more because now I have you know, reaffirmation of the what the, the pure data is, and then I have more instance of the noise, so I can really just get rid of the noise uh, as we add more. So that idea basically in here that basically if, if this is the case, then yes, uh, then we can do a better job. And then it brings this kind of idea in natural images. If you look at specific, look this image, for example, and this is from the original uh, paper. Um, if you look at certain blots um, in, in these images, then you can easily say, if I look at these orange blocks, right, um, then they are really very similar to each other. Uh, if I look at these green blocks, right, then the structure there is really very similar to each other. The difference is, so the data itself, the content, the pixel, the intensity values, the structure, they are almost identical to each other. The difference is that the noise that's happening at this location here, right, is different from the, 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 the instance of the noise at this location, is different from the instance of the noise at this location, and so on. So it really brings back this kind of idea that you have the same data, the same images, but you have different instances, the noise varies between one to the other. And the same thing in here, if you look at these blue um, blue uh, boxes in here, um, uh, or blocks, the structure wise, they are really similar, but the, the noise is uh, that these different three blue blocks are subject to are different, right? And the same thing for the orange blocks in here. So now um, this should really give you kind of idea that now I can really start to build this kind of dictionary, right? I can really build this kind of uh, these blocks. I can really have, I can have a combination of these, and now I can use all of these to really denoise that part of the, uh, or every single block in the image that has the same structure. And the same thing in here, and then I think the same thing in here. And each one of these will have its own uh, denoising, uh, denoising filter, right? Their own denoising filter. I don't really have to mix between them. I, I don't really have to uh, filter this and this together. I can filter them independent of each other because each one representing a different structure or different statistics of the image. Uh, and this kind of, uh, this idea is, is, uh, is, is really the main, uh, the main contribution out of the NLM BM 3 d uh, in here. Um, the, the challenge is, is that, um, it is not always there is this perfect, like if you look, go back in here, if you look at the blue, uh, the blue blocks in here, I mean, I would say, I mean, it, it's, if you are careful about the dimension, then they are really identical. Uh, but if you look at the green ones, it's really difficult to say these three blocks are really identical to each other, right? I mean, there's a, some variation in the structure itself as well. So this kind of assumption that um, they are exactly the same is not really, cannot really hold all the time in natural images or most of the time. So um, just taking um, this bunch of images in here and just averaging them um, will we'll, we'll average out or we filter out the noise is not always, uh, will not always really work uh, perfectly. So instead what this um, uh, authors in, in 2005, what they did, uh, they said, let's see, look at, um, we will do uh, uh, averaging, however, instead of uh, assuming that we have exact matches, we just have some kind of a, 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 a distance. There is a, a distance between the block that where we are and the block there. So in, in other words, I will have, this is where I am trying to filter now. And then I go through the whole image and then I try to find the blocks 
that are um, similar to this block in here. And then I want to use some criteria, right? And this criteria, they left it as um, uh, a user defined. So you can really define it using, I mean, you can really use SSIM, you can use DCNR, you can use entropy, you can use whatever criteria you think it's, is best to, to, to give you a similarity in this. And then they will have some kind of a thresholding and say, um, if, if the similarity in this between this block in here and this block in here are um, uh, below a certain threshold, then we would just say it's not similar. If they are higher, then we are similar. And then we can really start to build a dictionary in here using, using that. And then the idea in here is that you can just have this kind of weighted average which is really based on this similarity criteria. So now similarity criteria is really kind of the, decide the weights that you assign to, to, your, uh, to your average. Uh, and this basically, you can look at this as, um, and they have really nice details in the paper, how you can go from bilateral filter to NLM. Uh, in the bilateral filter, if you remember, when we had a very nice diagram uh, at the beginning of last lecture, uh, the first um, exponent is really for intensity weights, the second exponent for the spatial weights, and then you can really move on, and then you take basically that spatial weight to say, I want to take row to infinity, and then I replace that basically by having this intensity weight to be a function of the similarity, right? Uh, and this becomes your NLM in, in here. Uh, so these patches are really similar to each other, not identical, but similar to each other, and then that becomes your criteria uh, and or, or your weights for for the averaging. Um, it's very simple, um, kind of you know uh, algorithm. But you'll see now uh, when you look at the noise. Remember when we had our biggest issue with the spatial filters was the fact that our estimation of the noise is is always under um, uh, par. It's, it's it's not really uh, that great. And here's an example of the same as before, the six filters um, that we had, I'll show you a few, uh, few minutes ago. And here is basically the, the spatial filters, you can see them in the top in here. Here is how the, uh, the noise estimate. And here is the NLM estimate, right? You see the NLM estimate in here is really outperforming all these three spatial, uh, spatial ones. Uh, and it's really performing as good as these, um, these um, uh, transform methods. So the idea in here is that if, if you can really just be smart about um, how you can, um, you know, build that those blocks that you can really filter together, um, then uh, there is there is a way to, to, to have a more meaningful averaging filter. And that actually brought these people uh, two years later uh, to this kind of uh, very powerful uh, you know, the algorithm. It's called BM3D, but there are three components there. Um, uh, block matching, and you can now imagine what that means because NLM is nothing but block matching. And then we have 3D collaborative filtering. Um, and then uh, the third component is this fusion, and we'll see that in a minute, what that means uh, in here. Um, okay. So I, I, so the network is going bad. Okay. So again, I'll just give you the idea. It's, it's simple um, at, at the, the concept level, um, but powerful. Here's the main idea. So you go to your image, and then you have a reference block. We refer to it as R in this case. And then you do the same thing. You have some criteria for matching, right? Uh, and you say, okay, I, I will build, um, now I have these different groups, right? And each group has a reference, and then uh, then these in this specific case, these two red blocks in here are the most similar ones to this reference block R, right? And now I have this kind of uh, I create this kind of a tensor or a 3D um, grouping in here, right? So you can have this R and the other two, and now you have kind of this kind of a, a tensor you're, you're building. And now you do a 3D transform, right? So you are really transforming the entire tensor into, uh, let's say, a wavelet or free transform or DCT, some, some transform. In, in the paper, they talk about wavelets mainly uh, and, and free transform. And then you have the 3D transform. 
and then you filter using thresholding. You get rid of the high frequency content uh, using some thresholding, and then you do the inverse, and now you have this denoised uh, three blocks. So now you have the denoised block one, the reference block, and the third block, right? So now, in the paper, what they propose, and has been used quite a bit in, in many other following papers, but these are different images. Uh, you can see this is Lena, I think, and this is the, uh, I forget the name of it. This is Barbara. Uh, uh, I think this is the boat image. So these are kind of just images for many years. And they use the sum of square distances, a very simple sum of square distances, to build basically this kind of uh, pair. So in this image in here, this noisy image, this is the reference, and then these other one, two, three, four. What you notice in here, from this example here, from this one's in here, from this one here, that these blocks overlap, right? So every single pixel in your image construct a, a, a block or a box, right? So uh, you are really comparing, you are comparing the SSD with every single uh, uh, other block that's centered at every other pixel in the image, right? So you have a very comprehensive brute force uh, calculation for the SSD in this case. So they are overlapping, right? So that's that's fine. So these are just example of what kind of images um, that uh, are produced as similar blocks are similar, and you have this kind of a thresholding in here. Uh, so these are only examples. I mean, because you will have another reference block here, and then you will have another pair. But in this case, I'm just showing you one example, one instance of one single reference block in the red for every single one of these images in the test uh, data set. So now, after you have this, um, then um, now the question is, what do you do, right? I mean, it's, uh, you have the references, you do the 3D transform, and then uh, the next thing is, how do you how do you uh, how do you denoise? So in here, actually, it's it's it becomes nothing but it's your choice. Right? You can use any of the spatial filter that we did. You can use Wiener filtering, for example, um, or anything in between. And then you can uh, so it, it, the choice of what you use in here is not dictated by what they have in the paper. What they did is really kind of what worked the best uh, per their ablation study. And um, so um, the, the one major difference between this approach um, and the NLM is this important point. And that's something I emphasized when I talked about uh, at every single pixel, there is, um, there is, uh, uh, there is a block, right? Uh, the size of the block is a design, design parameter. Um, but the difference in that, in the NLM case, right, just as we did in the, all our denoising algorithms so far, you always focus on the center pixel of that block and you are denoising that central pixel, F hat of M and N. You are estimating the pixel value at M and N in, in, in F hat, right? But in, 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 in this uh, BM3D uh, framework, because you are really building this 3D and tensor and then you are transforming the whole thing, getting rid of the high frequency or you're doing a weird filter and then you are inverse, uh, inverse uh, um, transform. Uh, what you are really uh, creating in here, every single pixel, right, in every one of these patches uh, is denoised, right? It has a, a, a denoised value, it has a, a new value, right? So now you have a new estimate, right? So every single uh, one of them has an estimate. The question is, if you do it this way, so now imagine you have this image, you have this reference, you did this BM3D algorithm, and now what you have in here is the denoised uh, red block, right? But if you do it, um, uh, use another reference block, right? In the green in this case, you do the same operation, you have now a new estimates for all the pixels in these three patches, and now you have this estimate, right? So now the problem becomes for these pixels, like for example, like the one I'm, I'm here, and the one here, and the ones in here, you have two estimates, right? You have two estimates, one coming from the upper branch, the other one is coming from the second branch, because in the first branch, you use this as a reference. In the second branch, you use this as a reference. But are there only two branches? No, I mean, it's it's uh, many, many, many branches actually uh, in here. So you may end up with having like 10 different estimates for every single pixel, right? or for some of these pixels in the image. So 
that's where the third uh, component is to say, let's see, do a good job in um, any potential denoising um, group that could denoise a single pixel, just use that. And then after that, we have a number of estimates. We have a vector of estimates for every single pixel, uh, not necessarily they are equal. So the question now becomes, now uh, you have these different estimates for these pixels, how do you fuse them uh, together, right? Uh, so uh, uh, the very intuitive way to say, I wanna just average all these estimates because now we have a new value for the, the single pixel, um, uh, I just wanna average them. But what you keep in mind is that some of these estimates are really good, some of them are not really that good, right? So, so now there are really a lot of variations in the literature about how do you do this fusion? It's, it's, there's quite a bit of number of innovate, innovative uh, ways. So some people really uh, have different weights, uh, so you can really average them, but now uh, you have a criteria about how good your estimate is, and, and you can have different criteria of how good your estimate is from every branch, right? Am I if this is a better estimate, then I will have a higher weight for the estimates coming from this branch compared to this one, which has a bit uh, uh, the uh, underperforming uh, denoising uh, estimation. Uh, and some other folks really did, um, they look at uh, in the 3D transform domain, you look at how sparse it is, how many zeros you have there, and then you can have your weights inversely proportional because that means um, you have the whole energy in that block is really concentrated into very few coefficients in the Fourier transform, in the wavelet transform, or in the Wiener filter even transform, uh, Wiener filter case. And then you have your weight, but you want to give them higher weight in that case uh, because the noise is not really overwhelming in this in this group, right? Uh, and there are some others. I mean, these are just two examples of of what people have done in in the past. Um, and here are some. Uh, some uh, some cases where we have uh, what we call it hard thresholding in the paper is, is, is the number of the zero coefficients. And then there's depends on the Wiener filtering. You can can just use the Wiener filter magnitude as as your the inverse to your weight. Um, as I mentioned, there are really tons of, of, of things out there. But um, the other thing that people have done, um, and I think this is something um, maybe you have seen it when you look at this black diagram in here, is that um, uh, there's this fusion mechanism. Um, and after you do your first uh, round, right, after you do your first round of denoising, right, um, if you repeat the process again, this whole um, similarity criteria, this whole grouping, uh, it has become a little bit different, right? It, it might be very different, but it would be different for sure. Um, and now you have maybe a better uh, localization of these groups, or the fewer of them probably. And then, so there's this iteration uh, mechanism inherited into this algorithm. So, and that's basically what people have been uh, doing. Um, so here is, um, um, so you see, I mean, I, I'm having T as threshold in here. Uh, just to say, there's a thresholding happening uh, in the in the in the in the frequency domain, but um, you you do your basic denoising and you start with okay, let's just have a hard threshold, meaning that my threshold is really a function um, of the number of zero uh, non-zero coefficient in my in my uh, frequency domain representation, and then I do my fusion. Uh, but before I do that, then I will just go back and then have uh, sorry, after I do that, then I have a second iteration in here, and now I use the Wiener filter um, as 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 my uh, my denoising uh, kernel in here, and I keep doing it. Actually, I have seen people do this over a number of iterations, not not even two, uh, but it it improves the quality of of the estimates, and then it will saturate at some time in there. Um, okay. Um, so uh, whenever you, yes. Can, can I ask a question here? Yes, please, yes. Uh, so when we do this uh, kind of block choosing, uh, we are using some deterministic criteria, right? So if we iterate this, uh, are, aren't we going to get the same results or is there some randomness here in the process? No, because remember your criteria, I mean, usually you will have, let's say, 
I'm using, uh, I don't know, like SSIM or even uh, something even simpler, right? Uh, 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 so there, are, there has, remember that the blocks that you are dealing with in here, they will be slightly different from the ones you started with, right? So there will be some kind of a, a randomness happening that will give you um, more basically into the into the feature space, so you can really have better denoising, right? Um, but after you do it like a couple of iterations, then yes, what you are saying it becomes true because now it's uh, it's just you are not really getting any advantage, you are not really improving anything you are saturating, uh, and it all depends on. Um, I thought I mentioned it somewhere here. Yes, it depends on the level of the noise, right? And uh, the second one, uh, people haven't really done this quite a bit uh, in the denoising as much as they did in the image quality assessment, which is the type of noise, right? Um, well, the type of noise that you have and its impact, right? Uh, uh, that that's, that's also another another component in here. Uh, so my question was more on the first part of your answer about the the part that when you said every iteration we choose different blocks. So can you explain how that happens? How we choose? No, we don't. We, no, um, we. So you have to have your algorithm that you can start with. Um, so in the brute force kind of uh, vision of this, you every single um, every single pixel, right, can be the center of a reference block, correct? So now in the first iteration, um, you start to build, let's say, 10 different tensors, right? Um, or, or let's say, or, or even, I don't know, 255 tensors. But um, there is this grouping, right, in each tensor. Now in the second iteration, because you denoise the images, not necessarily your SSD uh, algorithm or, 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 or measurement will give you the same blocks in the same groups anymore. So a certain block may not be in the in the tensor one as it was in the first iteration. So the group the grouping will be different. In the third iteration, the difference between the first and the second might be large, between the second and third will be smaller. And then, and so on. I think there was a paper where they talked about, it depends on the Gaussian noise at certain levels, I think two or three iterations, and then you saturate after that. Um, so the saturation uh, depends on the noise level. That's the question? Okay. Thank you. Oh, so I, 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 I um, so the level of noise, um, the type of images, but also equally important, uh, the type of noise, right? Because uh, I think this is something uh, we discussed yesterday in the office hours, I believe, uh, maybe Monday, I forgot. Uh, when we talked about, you know, like when you have compression artifacts um, and you have Gaussian player, these are different different types of noises, right? Um, uh it it uh, it it they have different impact on on the on the on the image and on the statistics in the image as well uh, anyway so there are uh, different evaluation methods so in the next five minutes i just want to show you some of these results uh, very quickly um so this is the barbara and the bot uh, images uh, these are the original ones on the left hand side the ones in the middle are the noisy and the noisy one using the GSM that I haven't talked much about um, that I showed you. Here is the NLM. Uh, this is the Lina image, uh, it's an airplane image, an F16. And here is the, wall, the brick wall image. And you can see basically um, it's doing a really good job, uh, although it's a really simple variation. Uh, because of the flat region and the very strong uh, edges in Lina image, uh, maybe uh, the artifacts are much more obvious than one that you see in the F16 image uh, because um, you are just like me. Probably you are focused on on the airplane because it's very well defined kind of you know uh, boundaries. But uh, there are some artifacts in the mountain here, but you don't really see it much. Uh, it's a very busy area, but they did a good job in the cloud as well. And the bricks, you can see. I mean, they did really amazing job uh, here uh, because it's really this this kind of structure. And similarity between different blocks, um, so it was easy to create a dictionary for any of them. Uh, and here is the BM3D um, 
uh, the cottage image um, is the the rosy one, uh, the Claudina image, um, the Barbara image, and you can see in here it's it's uh, this is really fascinating, right? I mean, you can see how how remember when you showed these artifacts last time? It's just kind of the this pattern uh, in the headscarf is the Dargam, uh, but now they are really they are there. I mean, it's it's uh, it's, it's very solid, uh, well done denoising uh, in here. Um, and the same thing if you zoom into the uh, the feather in the image. You can see is the sections are there. There's some blurriness there because uh, we're zooming in, but but the sections are there. Uh, so it did really a uh, fantastic job. Uh, here. And here is uh, more of a, uh, a quantitative analysis. Um, it's it's uh, these are coming from three different papers. Uh, so it, it's uh, unfortunately we, in, in, in denoising, not like in, in, in motion compensation. Where we had the blur, uh, the, the Middlebury uh, database, we have a benchmark. We don't really have a very solid benchmark, but it, it, they, they are already working on almost the uh, same, same, same uh, images. But you can see in here, uh, BM3D, uh, and they're still, these papers they were using uh, PC and R and MSC at the time. So uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's outperformed definitely in LM and GSM and BLS, uh, especially uh, if you look in here. And as a criteria, as I mentioned before, uh, um, anything above 35 dB is is considered really good quality. And you can see what we have in here. Um, anyway, uh, here is some uh, more uh, more comparison as uh, the severity of the the x axis on the right hand side in here uh, is uh, our segments. And I mentioned this to you before. It's it's uh, it's really important not to Look at when sigma is very very high because that may not be very realistic, but um, to look at the reasonable range of sigma, I would say between 0.1 to 15, 20, maybe that's 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 a reasonable range. And here is some uh, subjective uh, quality uh, evaluation, and you can see the artifact in BM3D are really much much better um, than what you have uh, in the in the GSM, for example. Um, so. Um, the image denoising uh, was really, really very hot topic for many, many years. Uh, there used to be kind of uh, an expectation of an improvement of one dB every four years. Uh, and then in the last 10 years or so, uh, there has been quite a bit of saturation uh, since BM3D uh, came into the picture. Uh, not really um, one dB every four years, kind of not satisfied much, but uh, but still it remains a, one of the most fascinating problems in image policy, which is how do you denoise an image. Um, so this actually conclude uh, uh, this question by Ray, uh, did you say above? No, 35 usually, 35 and above uh, for, for standard definition. Uh, for high definition images, I would say 40 dB and above uh, is, is good quality. 50 and 55 above is, 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 is excellent. Uh, Excellent. So I would say anything below 20 is poor. Anything above 40 is good. Uh, 35, 40, reasonable, reasonably good. Uh, 20, 25, not that good. Uh, um, so uh, that's kind of my from my own uh, observation. So this really kind of concludes what I want to share with you about uh, image denoising uh, in the time that we have. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Oh, thank you. I did not the I did not upload the PDF. I'm, I'm sorry. Just too many deadlines, and I forgot to upload them. I, I'm sorry for that. Uh, so what I'll be doing? I will upload the slides right now. I upload this video as it is, and then for the first 15 minutes um, that I missed recording, I will add it uh, hopefully tonight after I finish the of meeting. Thank you, Z, for 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 the reminder. Okay, guys. Have a good weekend. Bye bye.